We are up to mitzvah number 75, and this mitzvah is a prohibition against allowing certain people to testify in a Jewish court of law. The verse says that we cannot extend our hand to help the wicked to become a false witness, and the Talmud tells us that that means that we should not allow the people that are disqualified to testify from testifying. Now, this verse specifically refers to a wicked person, and we'll see exactly what that means. But when we are going to discuss this mitzvah, we're going to talk not just about the wicked person who is disqualified due to character and integrity issues, but we're also going to discuss the various other people that are disqualified from testifying. And the idea here with a wicked person, the way it's defined in the literature, is that this is a person that does not care about their spiritual well-being. They don't care about Torah. They don't care about mitzvos. They don't care about doing the right thing for themselves. And they're not worried about the consequences of their own behavior. And therefore, how can we allow them to testify for someone else when we know they don't care about themselves? Certainly, we cannot expect them to care about others. If someone is going to provide testimony, we're going to trust their word to influence and affect the litigants. And it's only because we believe that they care, they empathize with other people, and therefore they don't want other people to suffer needlessly, and therefore they're going to give us the truth as it happened. But if a person does not care about themselves, we cannot expect them to care about others, and therefore there is the suspicion, maybe they're lying, we certainly cannot trust their word. This is with respect to a person who is wicked, but once we are talking about someone who's disqualified due to their deeds from testifying, the Sefer Chinuch, the book that we are using to guide us to the mitzvos, he proceeds to discuss the various other people who are disqualified from offering testimony in a Jewish court of law. And he quotes the Rambam who tells us that there are ten people that are disqualified from testifying. Number one, women. Number two, slaves. Number three, minors. Number four, deaf people. Number five, people who are mentally incapable. Number six, blind people. Number seven, wicked people. Number eight, shameless people. Number nine, close relatives. And finally, people that have an incentive, a bias in the outcome of the case, people that are partial to the case because it matters to them, we cannot trust their impartiality in providing accurate, honest testimony. So these are the list of 10 people. I want to go through them one by one uh, to see what what it means and what the source is and, and what the exceptions are, etc. So the first one, which I imagine is going to be the most controversial one, is women. We're told by the Rambam that women are disqualified from testifying in a Jewish court of law. Now, the source of this is found in the Talmud, in the book of Shuas, page 30a. And the verse says that testimony is customarily done by men and not by women. So this already gets us into the differences between these list of 10 people. Some people, they cannot testify because we don't trust them. They are dishonest. They have, they're crooks. They've proven themselves to be untrustworthy. And some people I hear by women were told it's not customary for them to testify. And the Talmud says that the source of this is that if you look at the description of testimony in the Torah, it says two men come to court. And therefore, if it's two men, then it's not women. So now all the commentaries, they try to explain um, just the parameters of this exception. So first of all, it's important to stress that there are many areas where women can indeed provide testimony. So for example, there's a concept called one witness being sufficient for matters of prohibitions. So for example, if I go to your home to eat a meal and you provide me with a piece of chicken, is it kosher chicken? Or is it not kosher chicken? There's no way for me to know. So how am I allowed to eat it? So the Talmud tells us there's a concept called Eid Echad Ne'eman Bi'isurim. One witness is sufficient 
in matters of prohibitions, in matters of ritual as opposed to monetary issues. And therefore, if I go to your house and you serve a piece of chicken, you're in effect testifying that this is kosher food. And therefore, I'm allowed to eat it because one person is sufficient. And the actual source of this, that one witness is believed in matters of prohibitions, is, at least according to some opinions, by women themselves. Meaning in the laws of Nida, the laws governing family purity, the person in charge of a, a marital unit, the person in charge of that is the woman. And she's providing testimony, and that testimony affects matters of prohibition, and thus she is believed. But there's a very long list uh, featured in the commentaries. For example, a woman who separates the chala, in effect she's testifying that the ensuing bread is kosher in matters of all matters of, of kosher any any time you provided a dish uh, from a woman she's in effect testifying to it uh, uh, laws of shita of ritual slaughtering as another example where women are are featured as witnesses and in fact even today when we have an industrialized kosher network so you have to have a mashriach a kosher supervisor to provide testimony in effect that everything in a restaurant or in a grocery store or a butcher house is kosher and that can be done by a man or a woman. Thus, in effect, we are saying that the reason why a woman cannot be tested or cannot provide testimony, first of all, there's many areas where a woman can provide testimony, but it's certainly not a question of trust. Another example, maybe the most important and consequential testimony ever featured in a Jewish court is what's called edus isha, testimony regarding women. And that refers to a case where a man separates from his wife, goes to war, goes on business, goes on vacation, and doesn't come back. And we don't know the man's whereabouts, and we don't know what happened to him. We don't know if he's alive or dead. So is his wife allowed to remarry? So if she remarries and the man comes home, it's a big problem because now she's married to two men and the children that she had with the second husband, they're mamzerim, they're bastards. And that's a huge problem. So we have to have the most unimpeachable evidence and testimony that the husband is dead before we can permit his wife to marry another man. This is the most consequential case that's ever featured in Jewish court of law. And we're told that if a woman provides testimony, I saw Mr. So-and-so dead, and therefore his wife can remarry, the most important case ever featured in Jewish court of law, one woman is indeed believed. Moreover, if two litigants agree that they want to accept the testimony of a woman, her testimony is indeed valid. So clearly it's not an issue of, of trust. And I think that if you look at the text of the Mishnah, it doesn't say the women are disqualified from testifying. What it says is, is that edus, which means testimony, no heges ba'anashim. It's customarily done by men and not by women. So one of the answers, one of the explanations for why a woman would under normal circumstances, not be a witness is that providing testimony in Jewish court of law is what we call a contact sport. There is fierce questioning and fierce cross-examinations and the court is encouraged to set up traps to try to ensnare the witness in, in false testimony. It's a very aggressive endeavor. And from the Torah's perspective, maybe women are more averse to confrontation than males. And if she would be allowed to testify under normal circumstances, she would be obligated to testify. And the Torah felt that that was not the right setting for women. Uh, so that's number one. We have the first person who's qualified for testifying under normal circumstances, even though under many circumstances, indeed, a woman can testify. A woman under normal circumstances does not testify. But we have shown that it's not an issue of trust.
The next person that cannot testify is a slave. Now, who, which slave are we talking about? We're talking about a Gentile slave. Now, we've talked about slaves in the past. I don't want to get bogged down with that whole controversial discussion. How can we have slaves, etc.? It's a discussion we've had in the past. But the reason why we're told a slave, a non-Jewish slave, cannot offer testimony is because of a verse. The verse kind of has a decree. This person cannot provide testimony. And even though a non-Jewish slave is really half-Jewish, because when you purchase a non-Jewish slave, you in effect convert them or at least half-convert them. And therefore, they are obligated in mitzvos to a certain extent, but that does not extend to testifying. Now, there would be an instance where a slave would be believed in a Jewish court of law, and not even a a slave who's kind of half Jewish, but even a non-Jew would be believed, and that's an instance of Messiah Lefi Tumo. When a person is conversing as per their innocence. Meaning, if we have a case where there's a Gentile who is conversing, and he happens to mention, just as an aside, without recognizing that this is being recorded, so to speak, he mentions, oh, by the way, in wartime, I saw this and this gentleman die. That kind of off-the-cuff statement may be submitted to Jewish court of law, and that would be almost the equivalent of testimony to allow that person, that deceased man, uh, his wife, to remarry. And the idea is, is that we're not relying on his testimony when he thinks we're relying on him, because that maybe would give him incentive to manipulate the events. But if he's speaking as per his innocence, then even a non-Jew would be believed in a Jewish court of law. The next category is children. Someone under the age of bar mitzvah, bar bat mitzvah, is not allowed to be, to offer testimony in a Jewish court of law. The next one is an imbecile or a lunatic or someone um, who is mentally challenged. That person is not included in any mitzvahs. If someone does not have uh, a certain requisite uh, uh, amount of, of, of mental stability, they're not obligated in any mitzvahs. And to offer testimony in a Jewish court of law is a mitzvah, and therefore they would not be included in that particular mitzvah. Now, the Rambam, when he talks about this, he gives us a description of what this person looks like. And he says that we're not only talking about a crazy person who walks naked in the street or who's always smashing vessels and throwing rocks, not someone who's totally crazy. Rather, even someone whose mind is is very frazzled and confused at all times, and even though you could catch him in moments of lucidity, but in general there's something a little bit off, behold, this person is included in the category of people that cannot offer testimony in a Jewish court of law. And he talks about uh, fools, people of, of very low intelligence who don't understand things, who just who don't get things. Uh, they cannot offer testimony of Jewish court of law. Someone who's very fr- frazzled or confused or impetuous or, or someone who's just not grounded cannot offer testimony of Jewish court of law. And the Ramam says that this is in the eyes of the court to determine because you can't make any hard and fast rules about someone about someone's mental stability, you cannot write them all down. The court has to make an evaluation whether this person can indeed offer testimony. The next person is a deaf person or a mute person, someone who cannot either hear or speak. If someone cannot hear but can speak, or someone can speak but cannot hear, regardless, they can offer testimony to Jewish court of law. And even if they can see perfectly, and thus they could process things as a witness. And even if their intelligence is superb, they are disqualified from testifying. And again, not because we don't believe them or we don't think that they have the capacity to understand things, but because of their lack of ability to communicate. They have to talk to the court. And they have to listen and hear and follow instructions of the court. And if they're not capable of doing that verbally or orally, then they are not qualified to testify. 
if you have a blind person, a blind person obviously cannot see themes. And as a result, he cannot testify in a Jewish court of law. The verse says that the witness sees something and is obligated to come to court. If he hears something, even if his hearing is superb, they say that people that lose, God forbid, one of their senses, the other senses, like compensate to a certain, to a certain extent. You've heard that idea that, you know, their hearing just becomes much more super sensitive and their ability to feel becomes much more sensitive. If you ever put your fingers on a braille board, I don't even know what that's what it's called, on a braille, braille pa- you know, piece of paper or like a, a sign, signage, this is a, a bathroom. You feel it, it feels like a bunch of kind of nondescript dots. But when someone, God forbid, is blind, other senses become more heightened and more sensitive and they're able to pick up on that. So you have someone who's blind, but their hearing is so impeccable that could kind of sense anything that happens around them. doesn't matter. Their testimony is not valid in a court. But what about the one-eyed jack? If someone's blind in one eye, they can indeed provide testimony. And finally, we get to the wicked person. The wicked person is the actual mitzvah that is the prohibition against allowing someone like this to testify. The rest of them are just the the rules, limitations, but it's not a prohibition. It's not one of the 613. And that is you cannot allow someone who is wicked by the Torah's definition to testify in a Jewish court of law. Moreover, this is interesting. Suppose you're righteous. And you're at a given location and you witness something. You know it's true because you were there. You look around to see if you have any witnesses with you and you see a wicked person with you. You are not allowed to partner with that person in providing testimony. Even though you know it's true, you know the testimony is true, nevertheless, you cannot extend your hand, so to speak, to partner with the wicked person to provide testimony to a court. Now, there is a discussion as to what kind of infractions and crimes a wicked person needs to do to become disqualified. There's a discussion as to whether or not it's only by monetary crimes, if they're a thief, if they're some sort of crook, and they like to steal money, and therefore there's the risk, maybe they're taking money for their testimony. That's one opinion. Ultimately, the conclusion is that a person commits any crime of any sort is disqualified from testimony. And the Ram tells us that if someone violates any Torah law, they're disqualified from providing testimony. And what if they violate a rabbinic law? Then they are disqualified on a rabbinic level from providing testimony. So he gives an example. If you have milk and meat together, that's a violation of Torah law. If you have chicken, poultry, and milk together, it's a violation of rabbinic law. So someone who does milk and meat together, they're violating Torah law, and therefore on a Torah level, they're disqualified to testify. If someone has poultry and milk together, or someone violates the second day of Yom Tov, someone like that is only prohibited, disqualified from providing testimony on a rabbinic level. And all kinds of theft are included in this. So if someone doesn't doesn't pay properly, if someone steals, if someone forces someone else to sell something they don't want to sell, If someone is shown to have been a false witness, they are disqualified. And this, incidentally, works retroactively. So if someone commits a crime, and we don't know about the crime until later, and in the interim they provide a testimony, but then we find out that before they provide a testimony, they had already committed a crime that would disqualify them from providing testimony, even though we did not know at the time of the testimony that they were disqualified, that retroactively gets disqualified. The Ramah also tells us, and again, this is all sourced in the Talmud, that if someone works in a field, that it's almost impossible to be an honest person. And almost everyone steals in that field. There's just no other way to make money. No offense to anyone, but that's kind of the reputation that let's say used car salesmen have. But they're always lying, always cheating. I don't know if that's true or not. I'm sure there are very scrupulously honest car dealers out there. But that's the idea, that that, that, that it's almost like an industry-wide plague, malady, if you will, where people just are not honest. In the times of the Talmud, that was a roe behema daka. If someone was a shepherd of small animals, the only way to really do it 
is if you allow them to graze and they kind of, you know, free range, so to speak, and they, oh, they're always grazing. And we just assume that they're grazing on people's fields. And therefore, you are taking your animals and you're consuming someone else's stuff. You're a thief. And therefore, unless we know otherwise, if someone has this job, they, they submit their application to be, to be a witness, to provide testimony for the court. What's your occupation? Oh, you're a shepherd of small animals? Sorry, you are disqualified. Let me know for sure that you are the one of the million who is scrupulously honest. The Mishnah tells us that there is a whole long list of people that are disqualified. One of them is a pigeon raiser or a pigeon flyer. It's not clear what that means. According to some, that means that they fly their pigeons and the pigeons are always pecking away and eating everyone else's stuff. Alternatively, it might be like the equivalent of a race, people that make money by racing pigeons. And gamblers of all sorts are viewed with suspicion, not because it's illegal to gamble, not because they are going to steal by gambling, but because if that's their only occupation, they are not involved in the advancement, in the progress of the world. We would call them today rent seekers. People are making money, but no benefit is accruing to kind of the GDP or the advancement of humanity. Someone like that who exists in a zero-sum world and makes money and loses money based upon just almost random things, there's a famous Rashi that tells us someone like this does not value the sweat that most people have to have to have to make a buck. And therefore, someone like that, because they don't know the pain and the struggle of, of the difficulty of making money, therefore we don't expect them to be as careful in providing accurate and precise testimony when someone else's money is at stake. Because after all, it's just money, right? And you know, if my pigeon flies a little faster today, I win it. Money's so easy to make. Money kind of comes and goes so randomly and so fast. They're not part of, so to speak, the advancement of the economy. And therefore, they cannot provide testimony. Uh, similarly, if you have someone that, this is again the words of the Talmud, they play dice, they're throwing dice. They play craps, what we would call it today. Professional poker players, we would call them today. Professional gamblers, the sharps, the sharps in Vegas. Those people will be disqualified for this same reason if they have no other occupation besides for that. If they, you know, run a landscape company and on the side like to play cards, that will not disqualify them because nothing inherently wrong with that. But if that's their occupation, then they are going to be disqualified. If someone does business with Shemitah produce, if someone is in general just a, a, like a loafer, not someone who's involved in advancement of, of humanity, then they would also be disqualified. The Ram tells us that if someone is ignorant, they don't know not scripture and not Mishnah, not the law, not the ways of the land. There's someone who's maybe we would call them a gamer. They just play games and they're involved in their world of Warcraft or uh, Dungeons and Dragons. I don't know. I don't play any games. But they're involved. They play games. That's what they do all day. They're not involved in the world. They're not, you know, they're not involved in the economy. They're not, certainly not involved in Torah. We just, unless we know otherwise, we cannot allow them to testify. If we know for sure they're a person of renowned integrity, and they happen to be someone who is just ignorant, then we would allow them to provide testimony. But unless we know otherwise, they would not be allowed to provide testimony. And finally, we have the shameless people. People who have no shame, we suspect, are not likely to provide us accurate and precise information to the court. And the examples featured in the Talmud, if they are walking and strolling and eating at the same time in a public place. By the standards of the Talmud, if someone is kind of eating in a very public way, that displays a certain lack of shame. Or if someone is is walking around naked, that's again the words of the Talmud, then they're not at all concerned about their own shame. And someone like that, we do not listen to their testimony. We assume it's not going to be true. Now, there are some other interesting laws. Of course, there are many, many laws 
you can spend a lot of time studying all the people that are disqualified. But just quickly, one of the interesting things that I saw here is how does someone undo their status of being disqualified to testify? You know, suppose someone was a sinner. They did a sin, but who's perfect? Now they've repented. They've paid their crime to society. They've been rehabilitated. Now it's time for them to come back and provide testimony. If someone does a sin and now they've fixed it, okay, it's as if they never did that sin before and therefore they are no longer included in the group of people, in the cohort of people that are disqualified. If someone was a card player, this is again the words of the Talmud, they were a card player and therefore they were disqualified from providing testimony, how do they undo that status? They have to take the paraphernalia they, that they used for their hobby and destroy it. So the way it's described, they have to take their, their little little chips, maybe, if you will, and destroy them. If someone is someone who lends with interest, they have to rip up their documents. If someone is a pigeon racer, they have to break whatever vessels, whatever tools they use for that, for that activity, etc. If someone does things, and I think this is a very interesting, just as a side point, if someone does things, someone develops a certain, a certain habit, a certain way of life, we would call that maybe an addiction. I feel like this Talmud is featured in the book of Sanhedrin, I think it's in 24 or 25, something like that. The Talmud describes a process of changing and transforming the way you were. You were a car player, and now you have to kind of in your head say, I am no longer that person. And you can't just make a decision to not behave like that anymore. You have to kind of do something active to shatter, so to speak, that previous identity and resume the way you were prior. The ninth person that's disqualified is a relative. There's a very long list of who's included and how far back do you go? You know, do seventh cousins, do they qualify? Not really. Uh, first cousins, yes. Uh, second cousins, maybe no. And there's the rabbinic cousins and, and it's a very long, complicated uh, uh, delineation of who is included and who is not included. But the idea is if someone is a relative, they cannot provide testimony for uh, the litigant. And by the way, this is not only for positive testimony, where we are assuming they're going to be lying, incentivized to lie on behalf of their, of their brother or their relative. Even if they say something negative, they are not qualified to be a witness in this case. The Talmud says, if Moshe comes to provide testimony against Aaron, Moshe, of course, is unimpeachable, right? We trust everything he says. Nevertheless, he cannot provide testimony to his Brother, And by the way, the witnesses can't themselves be related. So if Moshe and Aaron come to provide testimony, I'm sorry, they are disqualified. Moshe, the most reliable person of all time, the leader, Aaron. Who do we trust more than Aaron? Doesn't matter. Brothers, disqualified. And finally, there is what's called Nogea Be'edus, someone who is partial to the case. If someone's going to benefit in any way, from this case, and again, the Rama has a very, very long list of people that will be included, but if someone's going to benefit in any way from this testimony, they are going to be disqualified to serve as a witness. So again, to be someone who is a valid witness it really demands a lot, and there are many different ways someone can get disqualified. I know that um, I was once asked to be a witness for a marriage ceremony. Now, what does it mean to be a witness for a marriage ceremony? What it means is the Torah tells us that any change in status of a person has to be brought about by witnesses. So, for example, if someone is single and then they get married, now there are halachic ramifications. There's a new, so to speak, transaction that happened. They used to be single, now they're married together. And there are many laws that flow from that. This woman is now a married woman. Previously, she was single. That change has to be brought about by witnesses. So you have to have two witnesses who witness the marriage ceremony, the what we call the presentation of the rings, have to witness the 
the chuppah experience, have to witness the couple going into seclusion, and many complicated laws as to how exactly a marriage ceremony happens. If you don't have witnesses, you can have the greatest, most talented rabbi officiating in the world with the longest beard that goes to his kneecaps. It doesn't matter. You don't have witnesses. So I was once a witness for such a ceremony, and uh, my co-witness told me, he says, hey, if you look at the laws, it's pretty strict as to who's disqualified. You got to make sure that you're actually legit, you're qualified. And then he told me, he says, the way I do it is that I'm worried, you know, if you do any violation of any Torah law, you're disqualified. So how do you make sure that you're actually a good witness? The only way to do it is that as you're providing testimony, you're also simultaneously repenting. And therefore, if you're repenting amidst repentance, then, you know, you're not, you're not a sinner, right? You have a clean slate. And that's the way to make sure that your testimony is valid. It's a very interesting law here that we have. It's only one short verse, but uh, the amount of content that flows out from it is quite vast. The various people that are disqualified to providing testimony in a Jewish court of law.